Phil Harris and Josh Vegan come together in an incredible fortnightly podcast, Dream Big, Move Fast. A progressive contemporary conversation on what it takes to be a dynamic thinker, leader and role model. Backed with over two decades of friendship, trials and tribulations, they teach from real world experience and what it takes to dream big, move fast. Real leaders challenge people, true leaders set people free. Jonas Riddlestyle. So, Phil, what are your thoughts on this? Because there's an interesting thing about like leadership and management and that whole conversation around, you know, what are we doing? Um, Should I be tightly managing people? Do I actually set them free? Do I give them free reign? Do I make them work for systems? You know, when you see that quote, what do you think about when it comes to running and leading a phenomenal organisation? I think it's a really good quote. Um, I think from my perspective in leading people, one of the challenges is that obviously all people are all different levels and different diversities and so many people are at different stages of some people want explosive growth, some people want to become the the absolute best version of themselves, other people seem to be stuck in this kind of pattern of just coasting along but from my own personal perspective, from a leadership point of view, I feel it's my responsibility, I'm always just trying to get the best out of people so my connection with every individual is what can I do to help them to become the best version of their self and I think this quote, you know, talks really well to that. You know, it's kind of like that old uh, Michael E. Jobo, you know, wrote the year myth and in that he yeah. said that there was like three different things. It's like people that are operationally and tactically on the ground, um, you know, next level after those are then becoming the manager and managing the organisation and then the next level after those is then becoming entrepreneurial. And I look at it like in, in my world, I'm very much tactical on the ground operational, but I do no managing inside my business. You know, I have Kylie who's phenomenal inside my business that does that function. And then I literally jump up into the entrepreneurial spaces, you know, when we get our planning time and the rhythms to be able to pull up to that space. And it's really about that that lesson is, you know, when someone comes into my organization, you know, I've had a head of marketing ring me once before and say, hey, Josh, what do you think we should do around this marketing idea? And I said, well, it's not really my my area of expertise. Um, you're the head of marketing. That's exactly the reason why I've employed you. You do what you think you should do. And they kind of look at you a little bit weird that that first time that happens because they're expecting that as the business owner that you want to give all the answers to that. And I'm like, I'm not the answer, man. You're actually in charge of actually running that and I'm going to give you full freedom. And initially it's quite scary for them, but later on it becomes absolutely liberating because they're like, Josh has kicked the ball to me and just said, just run with it and do exactly what you want to go and do. And I love that as a concept. And so, you know, down into our business, we've got a very clear strategic plan. And one of those strategies is this KJT, keep Josh talking. So anything that's not me talking, I don't do in the business anymore. So, you know, flights, cars, accommodations, sales conversations, whatever it is that we're doing, I'm only doing the coaching component and and I'm becoming the best in the world at doing that. That's absolutely my area. And I expect that everyone else in my business, my head of marketing, my head of sales, my head of operations, I expect that they're going to become the best in the world at doing that particular function in the business. If you can get to that point that you can set people free, it is absolutely liberating because all of a sudden you've got people that are really, you know, thinking and talking differently about how the business operates. Phil, we're going to talk today about, you know, probably something that's one of the most important components inside of any business. And it's about like really getting a really clear, you know, business plan and actually getting a business plan that works. Uh, Most people are probably in a position that they, they pay homage to a business plan once every so often. It's the sort of thing that maybe they do a business planning day. We see that inside of a lot of organizations and never again is the plan seen again and, and nor is there any conversation around, you know, what, what we actually do with it and how we measure it and what success looks like. And, you know, I, I was looking at it the other day and there's one thing that I was thinking about was the Formula One, right? And I was watching Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton out there on that racetrack. And what really struck me is, is that, you know, in this race that Max is out there and, and he measures his lap time, right? So he's actually in a position that he's you know going around the course in a minute. And all of a sudden he sees that Lewis Hamilton is behind him and Lewis Hamilton's doing it in 50 seconds. And Max knows that that's a problem, right? Because if that happens over the course of the next 44 laps, that, that literally Lewis Hamilton's doing it in 50 seconds and he's doing it in a minute, like there is no way that Max Verstappen's going to win the race. And that literally, it really taught me that lesson that, you know, if he knows that he's so far out in front, then he doesn't have to push as hard around the corners on a wet track when it's dangerous conditions. So literally there's got to be something inside of a business plan. They've got a race plan. And I, I kind of think that's a very simple thing inside of a business. You've got to have a business plan. You are phenomenal in in driving this, uh, um, not only at a Harris level, um, then ultimately in your different service lines from property management to sales. And then down into the specific components around a salesperson 
and their teams and, and what that actually looks like. So talk to us about some of the things that you've learned, you know, in business planning and 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 and, and what this subject actually really entails and, and how people got to take it seriously or not in order to have an enduring great business. It's a great topic, isn't it? Because I think from my perspective, certainly my own journey, Josh, I'd say that um, business planning personally for me, as well as the company of Harris, that's been a real evolution. It's been really refined. What I would say is I would say that over particularly the last three to five years, I would say that we have absolutely uh, improved dramatically the way that we are using business plans. My experience from an individual perspective with salespeople is that most people who have a conversation with a salesperson, you know, tell me about your business plan, normally they refer straight to KPIs as if KPIs are the business plan, meaning, you know, next year I want to write a certain amount of fees that equals an X amount of listings and sales and appraisals and those sorts of things. And I say, so, well, yeah, okay, well, KPIs form a part of a business plan, but they aren't the actual um, business business plan itself. And so I think that the key takeaway for me is that there does need to be simplicity, but I think if you've got a high quality business plan that basically puts an endpoint destination of where you want to end up, but where a lot of people go wrong is actually operationally as well is what are the activities that, as you said, you said, keep Josh speaking, right? Is one of your key themes. Mm. What are the key themes that need to be done on a daily basis that is actually going to enable you to uh, to in fact actually win. So from a salesperson's perspective, if you can get real clarity over where do you want to be, and I always like to think for salespeople for me is um, embarking on a three-year journey. So think about where do you want your business to be in three years' time? What would that look like? What are the key milestones that need to be achieved in terms of um, how in fact you actually get there? And then operationally, what are the things that need to be done on a daily basis for you to in fact actually win? Now, I pulled out an old book that had been sitting in my book bookshelf, I think, for the last four years or so. Um, Josh, I hadn't read it. It was a book, I'm sure you would have read it, Atomic Habits, right? Uh, and inside that book, it was talking about the fact that, you know, everybody's got goals, okay? Everybody has goals, but what's more important than goals is actually the system, in fact, of how you actually achieve that goal. So everybody goes to the Olympics and everybody who's on the starting line, everybody has the same goal, which is what? To win gold, right? But what separates people and actually the achievement is the, you know, call it a system, call it a process. And I think that for me, when I was reading this going back only about a week ago, that's the analogy for salespeople, which is everybody starts out with the end go, oh yeah, I've got this goal, which I want to write 800 grand or a million. But the moment you go to talk about process, which is what am I actually going to do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, that's where the industry goes to shambles. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a really great analogy. Goals are great, mm -hmm. but it's the system. You can actually, without having a goal, if you've got a great system, you can still achieve great things, but mm -hmm. it doesn't work the other way around. I think this uh, whole conversation around like simple is best. Um, we've um, both advocated um, the whole conversation around having a one-page plan you know, which is ultimately that summary of all of the strategic thinking that goes on to create a great business plan. But there's a lot of work that goes on in the background to get to that one page. And you often look at a one page and you go, oh, okay, that looks pretty simple. Yeah, no, but it's all the thinking that we've done to get there. And I've seen a lot of go wrongs. And one of my favorite ones was this lady by the name of Billy Kerisk. And Billy was a phenomenal agent. She ended up becoming our changed agent of the year in New Zealand, the first year that we ever ran it. And Billy and I one day were sitting down, she's in Golden Bay and she wants to go and write a million bucks in fees. So we have a quick look at it about total size of market and all she needs, Phil, is 200% market share. And that was the massive lesson for both of us at that point in time, right? Some challenges there. Yeah, yeah. And then, Phil, and then you know, interesting enough, because when we spoke to Alexander Phillips, he would say, make sure that your marketplace is big enough for your aspirations. And the thing that I get is I hear a lot of agents that come in and go, well, I've got 500 you know, houses in my area or I've got 1,000 homes in my area. And I actually don't think that that's the measure because I say, well, how many sell every year over a 10-year average? because the number of transactions that happen in that area every year over a 10-year average is more important than just the number of houses in isolation. And sure, there's a relationship between both, right? In a new and establishing area and percentage of that are going to turn over is low, get to year six or seven, it's probably going to be higher you know, when, when you're in a greenfield site. But you do need to understand about how many sales actually happen regardless of the market circumstances of the day. Because if you've got 10% of 600 sales, you're doing 60 deals a year. If that market goes to 200 transactions a year and you've still got 10% market share, then all of a sudden you're only doing 20 deals. And so there is definitely a relationship to market share market share penetration and total size of market. What are your thoughts about some of that conversation when people are, are initially setting out, hey, what's possible for me? And then working out how am I actually going to do it in terms of organisational. So if you think about it, I think it was uh, Turn the Ship Around where, you know, they spoke about that like intent, organisational clarity and then technical competence. So where are we going? What does that look like in terms of our intent? 
organizational, you know, structure. What are the things that we actually need? People, systems, process, you get the idea. And then down at a technical competence level, what are the specific skills that we're going to need to learn to be phenomenal at prospecting, listing, auction, sales process, managing routines, arrears, um, you know, managing a property management business based on income as opposed to total number of properties under management. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot there in what you've just said, but I mean, we've just been through this with our sales team establishing business plans for the, you know, for the upcoming year. And part of that, Josh, what I'm hearing you say is, you know, really it's about confronting the brutal facts. So like so many salespeople kind of, they sit down to create these um, business plans, but reality is it's more of a wish list than an actual business plan. So just as you've suggested to say, well, hang on, if I'm going to achieve a certain number, let's actually have a look at the actual reality, confront the brutal facts, which is, does my market uh, even sustain the outcomes that I'm wanting to achieve? And just to take that at another level um, deeper, Josh, I think for, for salespeople, we've even gone that one step further now it's it's amazing how many salespeople don't even actually sit down to analyze their past 12 months performance before even start projecting you know and what i mean by that is going well hang on let's have a look let's just say for example last year you wrote 500 grand in fees your average con was 10 grand so you sold 50 properties last year which resulted in writing 500 grand a lot of people don't even understand that, understanding those basic numbers. But then if I said, if you sold 50 homes last year, Josh, have you actually identified where did those actual 50 sales actually come from in terms of the lead sources that you actually generated? So if I said, look, 10 of those um, listings of the 50 that you sold came from running open homes. Another 10 came from your core market of specialization. Five of those came from past vendors. Five of those came from past sellers, whatever it might be. If you don't have that as a basic starting point, for your business plan, how can you actually sit down and have a business plan that has focus on lead generation to even contemplate what are you just going to randomly pluck numbers of where you're actually going to generate listings from? So I think kind of leading to the conversation you spoke about is getting real clarity before you start projecting into the future Mm. on what it is Mm. that you want to achieve, understand the past, understand Mm. your business, understand Mm. the market that you're trading in. Mm. Now that we've got that information in mind, Mm. now let's start mapping out what our actual four projections are and how we're actually going to move forward. And this is like a really strategic like review of the business of where it's been to actually get a, a projection on the trajectory and where it can go. And I look at it and I kind of ask two different questions on lead source. I'm like, okay, great. So how did you meet the seller and how did you jag the listing? And to me, they're two very different answers. So I might've met Phil Harris at an open for inspection, but I got his listing because I rang him every single time there was a significant listing or sale in his area. Or I met Phil Harris at an auction and I got his listing because I actually helped his brother buy a property. Not like, you know, so that's, and they're two very different conversations around what was the initial lead source, but what did I do to nurture that and, to the point it came to fruition? And one really little um, quick tool for the guys that we use. So before we do any business planning um, mm. inside our organization, Josh, we have a very simple Excel spreadsheet that mm. we email out to all of our team and they simply have to go through and pre-populate. So mm. number of properties they listed last year, number mm-hmm. that they sold, mm. how many appraisals, what their average sale price was, what mm. their average com was. And then on next tab, on that spreadsheet is they've mm. got to go down and just do a breakthrough of mm. exactly where all of those listings came from. So say, so look, before we actually go on for project and build out our lead generation strategies for what we're going to achieve in the next 12 months, mm. just a little self-discipline to understand your business before we actually start moving forward. And what I love about that is that then all of a sudden you're saying, okay, great, so what's actually worked, but how does that relate to where we've been spending our money and our time and our resources? So we did this with an agent in, in Sydney and he's like, oh mate, I've got three buyers agents in my team. I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then we went through like the hundred listings or whatever that they'd done and not a single one actually came from buyer conversion. And I said, and that's crazy that you'd spend all of that money on that resource and you're not getting it because those people aren't asking yeah, that or, question. Or, or, or someone puts down this kind of radical strategy, Josh, for this, you know, for this next financial year, I'm, I'm going to get 25 listings out of my core market. Mm-hmm. And that's a great, that's a really noble goal that you've mm-hmm. put forward there. Tell me how many listings did you get out of your core market last year? One. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're actually looking for what a five hundred percent increase or something. Is that yeah. actually realistic? No, that's that's mm-hmm. a wish. That's not actually a business plan or a strategy. So mm-hmm. yeah, understand it before we move forward. And you know, Alexander Phillips and I, um, we've had a look, and his numbers have obviously substantially grown from day one of doing eight hundred grand to twenty plus million now. And the interesting thing is that every year we still play with the same three numbers: average sale price, volume of transactions, and average fee dollar wise. So what can we do to either to trick that up? And so ultimately, when the sellers sell, where do they move to? 
uh, when the buyers buy, where do they come from? So we can actually understand literally the before, core and after markets. Does that, and that's a really interesting conversation. It's like, if you're a great car yard, you've probably got a Hyundai, maybe you've got some sort of European mark, like an Audi or something, and maybe you've got like some really high end, I don't know, Ferrari as an example. And you know, they're going to start in the Hyundai and then they ultimately go and they buy the Toyota or whatever. And then they end up buying the really nice European car and then they step up into the Ferraris the weekend or on the Sunday, right? But that's an interesting thing is that like learn how to actually work the trade-ins about the lifetime value of your customers, right? Which is a really important mechanism. And I've always heard you, I mean, you've, you've said that for a long time now, Josh, like if you want to grow your business every single time, I think it's, I think it's always great to reflect heavily on your business twice per year, one for the new finance year and mid-year to take, actually take stock. Mm. But you've always said, if you want to grow your business in this, in this coming year, there's only a couple of things that we can do. Number mm. one, we, we can increase volume. Mm. Number two, we can increase sale price. Or number three, we can just increase our fee. Mm-hmm. Now, lastly, it's not that easy just to say, look, I'm charging 2%. I'm just overnight going to go to 3% in mm. my marketplace. Mm. But I've got to look at, is it volume? Is it sale price? Is it fee? Uh, and how can I go about generating that? It's an interesting conversation, like, because you and I have both um, come through that school about really understanding like an Everest mission. So if we were going to go out there and, and we were going to go and climb, climb a big mountain, then we'd actually have to have a plan on how we're going to go and do that. And it's exactly the same inside of any business that we actually say, okay, the purpose of the company, long and enduring purpose is never going to be achieved. Like Nike, you know, make people feel like they're an athlete when they put on their Nike gear. The mission is a really clear, specific set of numbers. So, okay, great. Number of listings, number of sales, market share percentage, you know, total size of vendor paid advertising per property, whatever those things might be. And then we then have the values, you know, of, of the way that we actually got to play the game. And I think you've got some really clear values, you know, like think like a customer, you know, like, like that style of conversation, you know, and, and, you know, work as a team and, and grow as a leader. And you start thinking about those three values. Okay, great. That actually guides behavior so that and when you actually don't have, for example, a, a set of rules, policies, or procedures around something, use those three um, values to actually guide decision making. So decision making can be done at speed. And then, you know, if we're going to go and do this in terms of market penetration, on terms of number of listings and number of sales, then what are the specific strategies on how we're going to go and do that? Okay, great. So core area strategy, what are we going to do? We're going to send out an email every week with what's been listed and what's been sold. It's basically a CMA report, except it's now done weekly. And that actually goes to all of my previous market appraisals and anyone that I meet in a street during the course of a campaign around 10, 10, 20, they're now going to go and get that email. The benefit for a seller in getting that email is that they're going to see what's new to market that's similar to theirs, what's new to market that they could upgrade into, what's actually been sold that's similar to theirs. It gives them an idea on what their place is worth. And what's been sold is something that they may have actually wished to pursue and what did it actually make compared to the original quote. That's an example of strategy. We're going to go and do that tactically. We're going to go and do that. And then the measurement is is what percentage of the homes in your area are actually receiving that particular report on a weekly basis. And so then all of a sudden you, you've actually just that STM strategy tactics measurement, you've actually got it. So how do we actually do that around here? And if it's not working, what do we do to adjust? Or if it is working, how do we go to amplify that to get that into the next core market that we're going to open into, you know, because we've worked out that heaps of our sellers move to the next suburb when they aspirationally upgrade and that's how we drag up average sale price over time. So Phil, your thoughts around that as a conversation to say, setting the mission, most people tend to do it where they go incremental growth. Okay, great. So I did 20 transactions last year. Phil, you know what? I'm going out there, man. I'm, I'm going for 22 this year. You know, like, and so it's like incremental one little step. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's a slow way to grow. Other people have said, okay, well, hang on a second, exponential growth. So I'm, I'm sitting at 30 transactions a year. I need someone in my team who can prospect, list and sell. And if, and if ultimately I can grow them to be a prospector, an a lister and a seller, And that literally then we could go to 60 transactions with that particular platform for growth. But I'm not going to put on a buyer's agent. I'm not going to put on a junior agent. I'm not going to put on an associate. I'm actually going to put someone on who's going to be a co-agent inside of my team. And the intent is, is that within a period of time, 6, 12, 18 months, I actually want them in the listing lounge room. And they're going to choose area, profile, demographic, type of property, whatever it is. And that's the sort of stuff that they're going to list so I can elevate into higher price type property and not lose some of that great real estate that I started my career on and still maintain and get them to move through. Thoughts on that as, you know, strategy and process? Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. I, I um, As I kind of alluded to before, I think it's it's really important for people to think uh, in three-year chunks, you know, and I think, Josh, I think you're the one that maybe coined the phrase level one, level two, level three mm. agents going back many years ago. It's half and basic days. Yeah. So that was, a, that was a key concept that I've really embraced inside our organisation ever since, you know, we started 13, um, 14 years ago. So I think when people are starting to think about growth, Yes, I, I get it. There are different marketplaces across Australia, but there are, I think you would agree, Josh, there are some pretty 
kind of universal laws around mm. a real estate agent scaling their business, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say, for example, you're writing 300 grand today mm. and you've got a goal, you want to get to a million dollars mm-hmm. over the next three years. Mm. There are some very, uh, what would I say, some consistent patterns and behaviours mm. and some consistent employments that will be made over that one and two year and three year journey, mm-hmm. you know? So you, believe it or not, you're not the first person to do it. I know. <laughs> There's just actually some some systems and some people that are in play. And if you just follow them, you can do it. And, and I'll say this to you, what is the difference between the person who writes 300 grand in fees and the person who writes a million? And in my mind, the person who writes a million provides a million dollars worth of service and some. Right. So in order to provide a million dollars worth of service, you are going to need a set of systems and you're going to need some people to help you to do that. Now, whether or not that's centralized infrastructure, like you guys have got some phenomenal marketing teams and admin teams and, and operational teams that helps a team to function, or whether or not it's someone who's going to literally help you to grow your number of open homes on a Saturday, you're going to need it. And I, I, I've got this bad thing in, in the training at the moment, but I go, you know, one open home, two open home, three open home, four, four open home, five open homes, grow a team and get some more. Six open homes, seven open homes, eight open homes and nine, 10, 11 and 12, grow a team and take it to 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And you kind of get that idea that if some of the best agents in the country are doing 28 open for inspections on a Saturday, they are not sitting in the lounge room guaranteeing they're going to be at that open house. So that business model breaks once you aim to get above five opens on a Saturday, let's call that 50 transactions a year. So that's where you've got to realize is that, you know, don't get jealous that someone else has got a different business model. They just have that, but you've got to be really clear about what your model is. I think, yeah, and that's why we're saying, Josh, like is, is don't argue with these universal laws that, that work um, within the real estate space. But I think a, one of the key things I think for the guys to understand is that if you are looking at your business in a three-year forward projections, I uh, the way I like to work with our team is to, is, is to think about two things. Number one is you've got um, KPIs and metrics, so actual numbers. So in three years' time, let's just say that goal is to write a million dollars. What is that? That look like in terms of listings, sales, and commission. So it's the minute how many listings and how many sales, so only three metrics. But then what are the top three priorities in three years' time that would support that million dollars? Mm. So if you and I went into separate rooms with a whiteboard each and said, you know, just describe, okay, with a, with an average sale price of seven, eight hundred grand, mm. what are the what for me, if I'm at three hundred grand today and in three years' time I want my business to be at a million, what are those top three priorities that would need to be in place? Well, I'd probably be a three man team mm-hmm. uh, in a in, a year, in three years' time. Mm. Number two, I'd probably have a certain percentage of market share in my in my trading area. Mm. Uh, and number three, there might be a skill base of a nine out of 10 listing presentation or something like that, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. So I think the guys can start to think about three-year projection, where does it want to be in numbers, understand priorities. So what are those universal laws of stage one, if I'm writing 300, mm. stage two and stage three, marry up those numbers, what are those priorities? And as you said perfectly well before, no matter what it is that you're aspiring to get to, somebody else has already walked that path. Um, simple process, implement those, get it documented to a one-page plan to start with, and then build out some operations behind it. So I love that because you then talk about like getting really clear about the projects that you're going to need. So, so what are the projects that are ahead to do that? So maybe you've got to put some infrastructure in play. Maybe you're not using a CRM and you need to, maybe you need to start getting your weekly email out and you haven't done that yet. Maybe you haven't really thought about what you're doing for your past client service experience. And, and that's a really important conversation because it drives referral network and a whole range of things and lifetime value of a customer. And then, you know, getting a group of people around you as your execution team to make that happen. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about when you talk about quarterly projects, you know, for a team? And or you talk about having an execution team around them, you know, what are, what, are, what, are, what are these things look like to help you to get to that Everest mission of that million dollars in this particular case? Yeah, I, I think one of challenges with our real estate industry, Josh, is that a lot of agents' self-esteem is based on how many properties they list and sell on a monthly basis, right? Mm-hmm. So if I've had a great month, I've listed and sold a lot, I wrote great comp, I feel really good about myself. Whereas the flip side of that, if I ha- don't have a great month, then I, it's almost like I'm a less of a human being because of the amount of properties that I sold. So mm-hmm. I think one of the major shifts I see with agents that um, continually grow and continually do well is there's now a new mindset, which is, yes, I've got my day-to-day focus, which is I've got to list and sell as many as I possibly can. Mm. But on the second side is I want to make sure I wake up in 30 days' time or 90 days, let's talk Mm -hmm. about a quarterly priority, Mm. and go, have I actually got a better business than what I did 
90 days ago. Yeah. So now we're working in this kind of two-speed economy, which is prospect, list, and sell, mm-hmm. one. But secondly, is we're now starting to implement and build a better business along the way. Mm-hmm. So when you think about 90-day projects or priorities, as mm-hmm. I would call them, mm-hmm. um, everything needs to cascade. So where do I want to be in three years' time? Mm-hmm. Where do I want to be in two years' time? Where do I want to be in one year's time? Mm-hmm. So what am I? where am I aiming to be in 12 months' time? Now, my 90-day priorities are purely linked to where it is that I want to be in one year's time. Mm-hmm. So for example, if I'm starting coal today, and I've got a goal to put on a PA in 12 months' time, what would be some of the projects that would be linked to where I need to be, okay, for in 90 days' time? So one of those examples might be, and by the way, projects are not KPIs. So projects, Josh, are not, uh, I want to make, you know, 150 prospecting calls. No, no, this is separate to your day-to-day business, Mm -hmm. but these are projects that are going to actually improve you. So some examples of that might be, if you're listening to this today and you're starting fresh and you haven't got a great business plan in place, mm-hmm. I'd say your project number one for the next 90 days would be to execute a you know, world-class business plan. Mm-hmm. So get a copy of it from either Josh or from you or mm-hmm. me or whoever, mm-hmm. but that would be a project as an example for the next 90 days. Because we get that in place, that's going to set us up for you know, next phase moving forward. And I love that whole idea, like, you know, what's your item of value? So, so I build an item of value, better known as the daily email, and I've done that over the course of the last 15 years. I make this 15,000 people that get a copy of that every day. Now, we had to build that out and get that out, out the door. Um, we're thinking about that, doing this podcast, Dream Big, Move Fast. That was a that was a project, wasn't it, where you and I said, okay, great, we're going to do this, and we built it out. You know, there's photography, there's back end, there's a whole range of things that needed to happen to actually get it to the point of execution. So that's a really interesting part because it then then leads into meeting rhythms. And, and this is interesting because a meeting with them is designed to do a couple of things. It's one about consistency of conversation and also to making sure that we're talking at the right level. So my favorite meeting with them, if you go to a great restaurant and you turn up early and you'll actually see that there'll be like the, the head chef, there'll be the head waiter, there'll be the head bar person, there'll be the head maitre d', whatever. <laughs> And what those people will actually be doing is that they will actually be talking about what's on tonight. So we've got a special on the steak frites. We've got a special on the tiramisu. And off the back of that, we've got some salad and um, um, martinis. And, you know, we're in a position that we've got some hawkies going out at $3.50 a can. You know, and, and by the way, at 7 o'clock tonight, we've got the Harris team coming in for dinner. And at 9 p.m. tonight, we've got Phil bringing in his wife for a recommitment ceremony, you know, like whatever the story is. So everyone in the restaurant knows what's going on. That today is like a daily directions meeting and it starts Every business day, where are we at? What are we doing? Gets people focused. What are some other meeting rhythms that you're going to need to have to make sure that you keep your business plan on track? Really great conversation, this one. And and my analogy for meeting um, rhythms, Josh, I think it's like when you take your your kids bowling, you've got those uh, on the side of the bowling alley, the the bumpers so that the ball Mm -hmm. can't go down the gutter and it keeps Mm -hmm. you focused. So I think the key things, uh, the key meeting rhythms for for salespeople, particularly to master. So number one is that daily meeting, okay, where you, you know, basically what's up, where you're stuck, what needs to be done today and there's a specific agenda for salespeople to follow, Mm. then I would say that there is a weekly meeting that is slightly separate Mm -hmm. to that for a um, salesperson and their team. Mm. And from that perspective, there would be a little bit more reflection in Mm -hmm. that meeting on a weekly basis. So did we actually hit our KPIs for Mm -hmm. the week? What open homes have we got on the weekend? Mm -hmm. Um, Where are we up? What have we got coming up on the listing radar and and sales radar for the Mm -hmm. next 30 days, wherever it might be? Mm -hmm. So you've got your daily, you've got your weekly. Mm -hmm. Monthly meeting, once again, slight variation on the weekly as well. It's a little bit more review time in terms of how did the past month go, Mm. what's the next four month looking like. I then move into a quarterly review, an extension of the monthly. So starting to review, how did we go over the last 90 days from both a KPIs and a projects perspective. Mm -hmm. So we're continually monitoring, did we actually hit our numbers? And secondly, have we actually improved the business? Mm. Because if we haven't improved the business, then we're not going to be able to get the scale to continue Mm. to grow. Mm. Um, After the quarterly, I go six monthly, which Mm. is uh, just a progression of the quarterlies. Mm. And then on top of that, then you start coming back to business planning. Mm -hmm. So I think that analogy, as I said- Just that annual piece, right? Yeah, exactly right. And so what that meeting rhythms do is that's what holds you accountable to this business plan that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. So everything kind of all roads lead to to one path, mm-hmm. right? Which is we're just continually refining, staying on track by having those meeting rhythms in place. And I love that conversation is reflect to project. You know, and, and you know, sometimes I take that and I take the weekly meeting and I break it a little differently. It's like, okay, great. Monday, I've got a great review on who my best buyers are in marketplace, who we're bidding on the weekend, what does that look like, who are our urgent buyers that need to buy, who's sold on the weekend, which now means that they're cashed up and homeless that we need to be putting into a different property. Tuesdays, that's my pipeline review. What am I doing with those potential sellers? How am I progressing them to market today? And Wednesday is my stock review day to go, okay, great. Where are we sitting with our current listings and what are we doing to make sure that we get them to sold? 
Now, the reason why I broke those up into shorter meetings as opposed to just one is that I found that some agents weren't paying homage to all of that stuff and were just like tick and flick and moving on rather than actually saying, no, no, this actually needs proper strategic focus. So whatever your meeting rhythms are, it is up to you to determine those and to make sure that you actually go to the level that they allow you to operate at. So sometimes it's very much tactical day-to-day. Did you pull in the Opal for inspection signs from Jones Street? Right the way up to visionary of when do we put on our next team member and what would they be doing in terms of the functions and what job roles are you going to let go of and how does that change your remuneration schedule? So if you're thinking about that, like they're, they're two different levels of thinking. Neither of them are wrong, by the way, because there's definitely every day you've got to be on that operational level, but you've got to be able to suck back up and get that overall historical horizon of focus to say, hey, you know, overarching, geez, we're not actually getting market share on that. That's not actually working. We need to change that versus, okay, great, we're down here at today's day-to-day level. And uh, and great little tip, I think you taught me this many years ago, Josh, is that you know all the best agents I see around the country now, they've all got these daily meetings as all-day appointments in their diary. Mm. So you come into that quick daily huddle, you pull out your phone or your computer, wherever you are, you open it up, there's your agenda for Monday. Monday, this is my core focus, this is what we've got to talk about, as you said. Mm. Tuesdays, it might be more buyer seller work. Wednesday might be whatever it is. So yeah, great little tip. Final principle today, stage, not age. And, you know, Phil, this is one of my favourites, you know, because like uh, we, we see some people that come in the industry that are, you know, 18, 19, 20, that, that have got a story that they're never going to make it until they're older. And um, also too, I've got people that are entering in, in the industry. I've got a guy right now who has started out in regional Australia, who's in a position that like, I think he's entered the real estate industry at 55 and he's gone on to go and write a million bucks in fees within two years. So, you know, um, talk to us a little bit about stage and our age and what you think about this as a principle. I feel like I've been on both sides of the scale now, Josh. I remember when I first started at 20 um, years of age in real estate, I thought it was too young and I found it hard and then I progressed quickly. And now it's um, 42. I don't know what that makes me old or middle-aged in the, in the industry. But no, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we've all heard the analogy. I know plenty of people who kind of plateau in their career. They've been in real estate for 20 years. Mm. And the saying is, what is it? Have you been in real estate 20 years or one year 20 times? I think mm. that's a really um, great way of summarizing it. But um, the reality is, I agree. It's it's whatever stage that you are at, age is irrelevant. Um, if you're there to serve, you can still do incredibly wonderful things. And I think there's a great conversation at like, you know, uh, and the Jim Collins like, line keeps on haunting me all the time. You know, what are you doing to be the best in the world or what you do? And then I then think about the Michael Jordan, you know, um, quote, and he says, you know, how good are you at your job and what are you doing to be the best player in the game? And I I think about that. Okay, great. So how good am I at my job? How good am I at my job? Okay, go right. And what am I doing to be the best player in the game? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I start thinking, okay, great. I've got to read. I've got to improve. I've got to continue to grow. And, you know, ultimately, um, I don't worry about competition. I don't worry about insecurities and doubt and fear and, and, and age and profile and demographic. What I worry about is those two things. How do I actually make sure that I'm you know, doing a great job at what I do and how do I become the best player in the game? And if you just think about those two key things, it changes everything in the way that you go to operate. Feeling good and ready for more? Thanks for joining us on Dream Big, Move Fast. Move Fast.